Hi folks, this is Jason. Hope you're okay today. It's good to be with you. Uh, we're doing a Google Hangout for an hour on the life and thought of Rudolf Bultmann, part one, and hopefully we'll be able to do part two tomorrow night. Um, and what I hope to do is to explore uh, the liberal uh, theologian, uh, Rudolf Bultmann. Uh, he's a very important theologian, and um, it's good to know the history of theology. Uh, as you all know, I'm an evangelical preacher and I believe the Bible is the Word of God. I do not agree with uh, Boltman's theology in any way, so I don't want you to get the wrong impression that this is all about endorsing Boltman. I certainly do not endorse Rudolf Boltman's theology. But as uh, someone who has a theological education, and who reads widely in theology. I like to read about other theologians and I like to think about what they've said. And I think it's also good for uh, Christians to know what other people are thinking or what other people have thought in the past. And so that's really the whole point of this is, is really it's an educational uh, piece to educate people as to uh, the history of Christianity and various theologians. So again, I must re reiterate that because we are doing the life and thought of Rudolf Bultmann, I am not endorsing his theology. If you want to know my theology, go and listen to the preacher Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, or go to the Brief Fellowship and listen to the lectures of Francis Schaeffer, and put Lloyd-Jones and Francis Schaeffer together, and that's where I stand, theologically speaking. Uh, so that's where I am. So without further ado, we're going to just pray, and then share a scripture, and then we shall get on. <coughs> Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for your love. And we thank you for your grace, and we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. And Father, we pray as we look at uh, Rudolf Bultmann today, I just pray as we think about his life, I pray as we reflect upon it, that we can learn some lessons for today uh, in our own ministries, in our own walk with you. Uh, we ask this, Lord, in your name and for your glory. Amen. <clears throat> so the scripture reading um, is... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, it says, I give you command to the presence of God in Christ Jesus, the one who will judge the living and the dead, and by his coming and his kingdom preach the good news. Be ready at all times and tell people what they need to do. Tell them when they are wrong. Encourage them with great patience and careful teaching, because the time will come when people will not listen to the true teaching but we'll find many more teachers who please them by saying things they want to hear. So that, that's just a scripture to encourage us to make sure that we're biblical pastors, biblical preachers, biblical theologians, and biblical Christians. Rudolf Bultmann was certainly not biblical in the sense that he believed the full inspiration of the Bible and what Orthodox Christianity teaches. And the church, above all else, needs shepherds who will shepherd the sheep. Faithful theologians, faithful shepherds. And for all the conversation that we're going to talk about Boltman today, he was not a faithful shepherd of the Word of God. And no matter how big a reputation you have as a theologian, your primary job is not to be an intellectual, it's not to be an intellectual superstar in the academic world, in theology. Your job as a theologian is to shepherd the sheep. Your job as a theologian is to feed the church the Word of God and you have to be faithful to, to that task. So without further ado we're now going to talk about Rudolf Bultmann which will be more of an academic theological uh, discussion. Um, the source for this <coughs> for this uh, reflection today is from uh, David Ferguson's Rudolf Bultmann um, series, Continuum, London, New York, 
1992. So that's where the source of this um, discussion uh, is coming from. I, I've read half of the book and uh, I have interacted with some of Bultman's writing. Uh, on page one, it says that Rudolf Bultmann was born on the 30th of July, 1884. Um, Bultmann was educated uh, under liberal theologians. Um, His academic career developed uh, where he taught a uh, junior lecturer in Marburg in 1912 to 1916, was associate professor at Belus in 1916 to 1920, professor in Gießen in 1920 1921, and returned to Marburg in 1921. Um, the most important thing I think is to remember that Boltman's theology, uh, this is what the writer uh, Ferguson notes here that on page two, that his theology was done in the context of Europe and in uh, military conflict. We had the First World War uh, and then we had the Second World War and so Boltman's theology and theological reflection is coming within that context. In his later life Right about 1951, he goes to the United States and delivers the Schaffer Lectures at Yale Divinity School in 1955. He came to Britain where he gave the Guildford Lectures at Edinburgh University. And Boltman died on the 30th of July, 1976. <coughs> there is an article um, published uh, on Boltman's life um, just trying to get the reference. The various Yeah, um Sorry, the, the reference here, which I'm about to read a quote from, from Boltman, is, is faith still possible? Memories of Rudolf Boltman and reflections on the philosophical aspects of his work, Harvard Theological Review, uh, 75, 1982, page 2 and 3. So this is a quote, not sorry, not by Boltman, but by Hans Jones, one of Boltman's students. Boltman was the only one of my academic teachers to whom I paid a farewell visit before my emigration. It was in the summer of 1933. Here in Marburg we sat around the dinner table with his lovely, so richly emotional wife with the three schoolgirl school girl daughters and I related what I had just read in the newspaper but he not, but he not yet, namely, that the German Association of the Blind had expelled its Jewish members. My horror carried me into eloquence. In the face of eternal night, so I exclaimed, the most unifying tie there can be among suffering men, this betrayal of the solidarity of common fate. And I stopped, for my eyes fell on Boltman, and I saw that a deathly pallor had spread over his face, and in his eyes was such agony that the words died in my mouth. In that moment I knew that in matters of elementary humanity one could simply rely on Boltman, that words, explanations, arguments, most of all rhetoric were out of place here, that no insanity of the time could dim the steadiness of his inner light. He himself had not said a word, ever since this episode has belonged to the image of the inwardly moved but outwardly so unemotional man. So, politically, in the time of um, the Nazis, um, Boltman spoke out against it, which I'm going to mention later. Whether you agree with Boltman or not, and I don't agree with his theology, um, you have to give him the fact that he was a very sincere man. 
politically speaking, where he did stand up against Hitler, which did cause a breach between him and his friend Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger was, um, as you probably know, a philosopher, a well-known um, philosopher even today is widely read, but uh, Heidegger was influenced by Nazism at the time, the more the, the kind of uh, the more of the political uh, socialist kind of, I think, Nazism. Uh, he was influenced by that, and but that caused a breach between him and Rudolf Bultmann. Um, now, now we get to the, my favourite part, and so we can I can talk ad lib now. Uh, so we we stuck closely to. The first chapter of um, David Ferguson's book. Uh, now I could speak more loosely. Um, in the second chapter, uh, he talks about the legacy of liberalism, and he talks about the Enlightenment's critique of religion. He talks about the Bible, and he so he, he notes that. Well, first of all, it's important to note that Bultmann was a child of liberal theology, that he, he grew out of liberal theology, that he kept on the liberal theological tradition. This is a key with Bultmann. If you don't understand this, then you don't understand Bultmann, that he was an inheritor of liberal theology. And so you have to understand the psychology of liberal theology, how it came to be. So... The first thing is is about the Bible. The Bible came under massive attack during the Enlightenment with the scientific revolution. Um, you had Newton and the new sciences developing, and it seemed that the Bible was just out of focus. There was also questions about authorship, biblical criticism. Um, there were questions about who wrote Moses, the book of uh, the book of the Pentateuch. Was it Moses? So you had this scientific revolution and you had this biblical criticism rising and this was a devastating attack on the Bible during the Enlightenment. There was also the devastating attack by David Hume. David Hume was saying that miracles can't happen because miracles don't happen. Natural laws take place but they, there is no evidence for um, miracles taking place. And so Boltman inherited this this Enlightenment perspective, which came also from you. You had the dismantling of philosophical proofs by God, by Immanuel Kant. And so these three great facts in the Enlightenment, the new sciences, the biblical criticism, well, four facts, the, the biblical criticism, the new sciences, and the powerful philosophical argument by David Hume and the powerful philosophical argument by Immanuel Kant led to the creation of liberal theology. If you don't understand that, you don't understand liberal theology, that those are the areas that, that created liberal theology. They were the kind of health, breath, the air that liberal theology breathed they were the heirs of the Enlightenment, the new knowledge. And just incidentally, um, I want to go back and just critique the Enlightenment just for a second. Critique the, 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 um, the Enlightenment position before we move on to the development of liberal theology. So what we're doing now is we're looking at the intellectual heritage of Rudolf Bultmann. The writings that he wrote, the thinking that he did, comes from the intellectual roots of liberalism. But liberalism was, an, was a child of the Enlightenment. So I just want to unpack, just for a minute, the problems with the Enlightenment perspective that we have now. So, first of all, biblical criticism. In the Enlightenment, because of Walhausen, uh, Moses, uh, the Pentateuch, came under critical attack. And it has held sway, Walhausen hypothesis has held sway 
for a few hundred years. It's been a powerful critique against the Pentateuch. But it's interesting to note <clears throat> how fashions change. That the Valhausen hypothesis today is basically and has been in a crisis. The scientific attack upon the Bible, well, I think that actually today I think we can I, I think we can say that science shows the Bible to be correct. It was only a few years ago the scientists said that matter was eternal. Now they say matter had a beginning, the Big Bang. That's one area where science for a long time said that matter was eternal, the Bible is wrong, but had to change the perspective, say no, there was a Big Bang. <clears throat> and I could go on with other areas where science actually confirms the Bible, not deconfirms the Bible. David Hume's argument against miracles uh, can easily be debunked on two perspectives. The first perspective is the historical perspective. To use a scientific argument to say that miracles can't happen because in history, uh, in, in, in our experience, we don't see miracles happen, that nature works according to um, its structures and those structures don't allow for the supernatural, etc. That kind of argument can be debunked on two grounds. Number one, historical grounds. At the end of the day, if someone claims a miracle has taken place in history, then you cannot prejudge that miracle claim. You have to examine the miracle claim to see whether it comes under the scrutiny and passes the test. It's interesting to know that skeptics generally don't have any test to test whether a miracle has taken place in history. Now, David Hume actually did come up with five criteria to examine miracles. And when he used those five criteria on miracles, i.e. the miracles that took place in France in the 1600s, he said that they fitted his criteria and that according to his criteria they were miracles. But then again he said even though they fit my criteria, I still can't accept miracles because miracles just don't happen. So basically, Hume's argument can be debunked based on the fact that you have to have a criteria to look at them in history. And if you have that criteria, they might actually prove miracles take place. He proved it to David Hume, but he still pushed the evidence away. Secondly, the scientific argument doesn't hold water. Because at the quantum level in science, in the physical realm, we found that we don't really fun, uh, fully understand what's going on at the quantum level. So it could possibly be that an event takes place in history that we did not understand because we don't understand the quantum level. So in other words, science works on probability. And there's always a possibility that your understanding of a particular piece of knowledge in the physical realm will be overturned. So in other words, you always have to be open. You cannot be exclude the possibility of a miracle. Because you cannot say for sure what goes on at the quantum level. So you always have to be open. So on the science, on the biblical criticism, on David Hume's argument, uh, the Enlightenment is in trouble today. And then finally, the philosophical argument by Immanuel Kant. Apparently, he debunked the philosophical arguments for the existence of God, but yet it's interesting to note there has been a revival in the philosophy of religion the last 20 years. Powerful analytic philosophers who were Christians have begun to write massive critiques of secularism, and there are now departments within universities that are actually studying these philosophers, such as Alvin Plantinga. So the philosophical arguments have not gone away. They've actually come back, but in different forms and in a robust manner than ever before. And the philosophical defense of Christianity 
is stronger now than it ever was. So that's just a little thought on the actual enlightenment. But let's get into more detail about how uh, liberal theology developed. First of all, you had Frederick Schleimacher, 1768 to 1834. He was the doyon of the development of uh, liberal theology. And basically what um, Schleiermacher said is religion is not based in the intellect, uh, Christianity is not based on an argument, it is based upon a feeling, a feeling of consciousness, that within Christ is the full consciousness of the God consciousness, and the church is the consciousness of the God consciousness that we find in Christ. And it's this consciousness uh, theology, uh, this reflection of this consciousness within community, that was the foundation and the development of liberal theology. Then you had Ebrecht Rachel in 1822 to 89, and he wanted to locate the Christian faith best rooted in history. So he looked at the kingdom of God and tried to analyze what the kingdom of God was. We read, um, just see if I can find it. Uh, in the Christian Doctrine of Justification and Reconciliation, Edinburgh 1900, page 387, this is Richel. He says, thus what in the his his historically complete figure of Christ we recognize to be the real worth of his existence gained for ourselves through the uniqueness of the phenomenon and its normative bearing upon our religious ethical destiny the worth of an abiding rule since we at the same time discover that only through the impulse and direction we see from him is it possible for us to enter into his relation to God and to the world. So what Rachel wanted to do is get to the historical core of Christ and then from there deduce some practical lessons in, in living the Christian life. Um, basically it was a socialist agenda that he used to apply to Christianity and the hermeneutic of Christian text. So when he talks about the kingdom of God, it's really just another word for socialist ideas, really. Uh, but Ritchell was a very important plank in the development of liberal theology. His school was a powerful school in the 19th century when many people followed his ideas. He was what is called, in quotes, a post Kantian. In other words, he was influenced by. Kantian philosophy. Then the development of liberal theology can be found in Wilhelm Hermann, 1846 to 1922. He writes, knowledge of God is not generally valid or probable knowledge, but is the defenseless expression of individual experience. So in other words, again, it's not about intellectual faith, but it's about experience. This whole liberal agenda, uh, liberal theology that developed with um, Yeah, sorry about that. Um, the development of liberal theology was undercut by the history of religious school, uh, especially by Ernest Trollich, 1865-1923. Basically, they were saying that you've got to get back to the first century, and also they were saying what's so special about any particular historical time frame, because all time frames are connected to each other. And that basically challenged the presupposition of liberal theology which said that even though they don't have an intellectual argument for Christ they had a, an experience or a feeling or a social connection with Christ uh, the Christ of faith it presumed that Christ was unique amongst 
any other historical figure. But the history of uh, the history, the historical school, were basically saying, "Well, what is what is the difference? Why is one particular history more important than another?" It, it can't be because all historical situations flow through other historical situations or events. All other events, historical events, flow by other historical events. So Ernest Trollich, uh, 1865-1923, was important in the development of this. And we read, this entanglement of Christianity in the wider context, this is the historical school's philosophy, and this is what undercut liberal theology. <clears throat> Excuse me. This entanglement of Christianity in the wider context, this is this is Trollich. This entanglement of Christianity in the wider context of the history of religion, with all its analogies and real connections, and in the currents of ordinary practical and intellectual life, place it completely in the stream of the historical process. The question then arises how far its religious ideas and power is in any respect ultimate, perfect and absolute. The concepts of revelation and redemption asserted by the older liberalism and by Schleiermacher, though in the form of absolute religion, breaking through rather than as a miracle opposed to all the rest of history, are thus threatened by being drawn into the fluctuations of revelation in ordinary spiritual life. It becomes a question how far Christianity has such a definite religious phenomenon which complete everything. It therefore becomes a question too how far it is to, to, to be seen as revelation and redemption in the absolute sense. End of quote. So I'm just going to backtrack now, um, and I just want to unpack about liberalism. Um, some some key things about liberalism that I think need to be worked over. Again, I must stress this is important. We've looked at the development of liberal theology. Now, again, it's important to note that Bultmann was an, an heir of this liberal tradition of theology, and he was to take this liberal theology on and move it on into the 20th century. But what I want to do is just, each time we go through these various movements, I just want to reflect upon their implications, and I want to deconstruct them. So I want to deconstruct the liberal theology that was in Schleimark and Ritchell and Herman, and to point out to you uh, the problems of this liberal theology. First of all, liberal theology was non-propositional. It didn't believe in propositional revelation. It didn't believe that there was eternal propositional truth given in the Bible. Um, so what tended to happen is the primacy of the intellect and the importance of objective truth was pushed aside and basically um, there was a giving up of the idea of the classic understanding of Christian truth and more of a softening and becoming a subjective so for example Schleiermacher was saying that the ground of Christianity is feeling and he tried to give the feeling of, of consciousness some kind of objectivity by talking about community and that in the community there is objectivity there if we study it there we can find the consciousness but ultimately it's on the the individual's faith is rested on feeling but that is subjective and I think Christianity talks about be transformed by the renewing of your mind it talks about Jesus dying and rising again in the gospel and that this is the truth so Christianity is not just about feeling it's about the truth of the gospel so that was a dangerous teaching by Schleimacher and then when you look at Rachel basically his art, if you look at his, his massive book uh, on justification it's an absolute massive book I've looked at some of what he said but you'll find uh, in the book that he has a polemic, and the polemic goes something like this, that the church is not being faithful to the Bible, we're going to be faithful to the Bible and go back to what the, the Bible actually teaches and what it actually teaches. It doesn't teach 
justification by faith in the personal sense it actually is a more communal community aspect of of justification so the problem there is salvation is moved from personal salvation to community salvation um, so basically what we're getting really is not biblical exegesis is basically bringing in socialism and using that as a hermeneutic and then saying that you're being biblical but putting biblical language to socialist ideas and that's all as liberalism was liberalism was just a socialist agenda to show practical care to people which is, is good but it was not Christianity in the sense of coming from Christian theology it was coming from political reflection using political ideas but transmuting those political ideas into theological words and then saying that is biblical now on the historical the, the uh, historical school by Ernest Trollich I agree that they, the church needed to go back to the first century I agree with this position that the historical school stated but the reason why it th this school is significant and why it undermined liberalism is liberalism again had the presupposition that Jesus was special but the historical school was basically saying that all historical events flow into each other so why is there a special event they're all connected there is no isolated special event and so that was a, a major challenge to liberalism the other thing that challenged liberalism is first world war because that made people realize that this liberal theology that said everything's going to be peaceful and we're all going to love each other just wasn't in reality going to happen because they had the first world war from the liberalism later into the developed a quest for the historical Jesus which I'm going to talk to you now and this is important in understanding where Bultman lay in all this in 1929-81, Gotthold Lessing, a German, wrote about the ugly ditch in history. And basically what he said is, we can't get, how can we get to the historical past? We only know it by probability. We can't get to the historical core of Jesus. It was a major, major essay in, in Germany at the time and has continued to have a relevance today so we can never fully get to the core of Jesus historically that's what Rudolf uh, sorry that's what Lessing was saying and that was a major plank in the development of not only liberal theology but in the historical Jesus studies you had um, people like David Frederick Strauss the life of Jesus 1835 that were extreme rationalists that discounted miracles uh, you had uh, Ernest Renan his life of Jesus 1863 who said Jesus was a romantic poet then you had the development of FC Barr and the Tubingen School and you had excuse me, you had uh, landmark writers such as Reed and Wise and then you had the development of eschatology that is to say that there was a looking at Jesus from end time teaching of what Jesus taught so we read these words it's imperative to perceive Bultmann as a thinker in this historical tradition as we have seen he trained as a New Testament scholar rather than a systematic theologian 
So basically, it's imperative to see all that I've just talked about that Boltman came through the Enlightenment, came through the liberal theology. Uh, we read, liberal theology owed its distinctive character chiefly to the primacy of historical interest. In that field, it made its greatest contribution. We who have come from a background of liberal theology could never have become theologians, nor remain such as we not encountered in the liberal theology the only search for radical truth. Here we felt was the atmosphere of truth in which alone we could breathe. That was Bultman. Now, so liberal theology went through a crisis. It went through a crisis because the First World War shattered some of its basic ideas. And new theological thinking about eschatology undermined the liberal agenda and liberal theological reflection. But then you had a new movement which Bultmann became part of, which was the dialectical school of theology. You had um, Karl Barth in 1868 to 1968 and, and uh, Frederick Gorkerton 1887-1867. And Bultmann was part of this movement and basically this movement was basically saying that God acts in history that we can't fully know God. Uh, Bart wrote a, a commentary in 1922 on Romans which fleshed out some of this idea. But basically it was kind of taking existential philosophy and it's basically saying that we can know God in the moment. We can know God in the action. but only as the God or holy other. You do not know God in propositions. You do not know God in historical truth, but only in the act. And so Boltman became part of this Bartian, uh, Bruner, kind of neo-orthodoxy or dialectical theology. I want to just give a little critique of dialectical theology. First of all, the problem with dialectical theology or neo-orthodoxy is, number one, these theologians were not um, inerrantists. They didn't believe in the full inspiration of the Bible. Karl Barth didn't believe in the full inspiration of the Bible. Boltman didn't believe in the full inspiration of the Bible. The implication of that is, basically, if you're building a theology and it's not fully based on the Bible, then it becomes your own theology. And so in the end, Karl Barth builds a theology based on his own ideas. It seems as if he's being biblical, but he's not. There's a, there's a hermeneutic of control from his inherent rationalism, which is a kind of existential kind of philosophy that's being brought to bear on his interpretation of the Bible. The New Testament of Theology, uh, page 39, we read, The Gospel is not a religious message to inform mankind of the divinity or to tell them how they may become divine. The Gospel proclaims a God utterly distinct from men. Salvation comes to them from Him because they are, as men, incapable of knowing Him and because they have no right to claim anything from Him. The Epistle to Romans, 1933, page 28, sorry. Now, that's uh, Karl Barth. Uh, 
I'll just read that again. The gospel is not a religious, religious message to inform mankind of the divinity or to tell them how they may become divine. The gospel proclaims a God utterly distinct from men. Salvation comes to them from him because they are, as men, incapable of knowing him because they have no right to claim anything for from him. Just a few things here, and I want to say this about liberalism as, as well as neo-orthodoxy or dialectical theology. And um, Boltman took the dialectical theology. He took liberalism, he took dialectical theology, he put them together, and he came up with his own theolo theology, his, his existential kind of theology. Yeah. So we've critiqued liberalism, but I want to critique neo-orthodoxy. And not only are these neo-orthodox theologians that they weren't inerrantists, but they will use Christian language, religious language, and they basically don't mean the same things as that you and I use them. When they talk about God, they're not talking about the God of history, the God who, of the Bible. The God they are talking about is a God you cannot know. It's a God you cannot really know. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible is a God of truth that you can know this God. You can't know God fully, but you can know this God in truth. And there's the big difference. So all this language seems to be Christian, but it's actually devoid of Christian theology. It's actually devoid of what actually the Bible's teaching. And yet you wouldn't miss it unless you were trained in theology. Uh, the, the other thing about these uh, neo-orthodox theologians, um, if you look at Bultmann's Dogmatics, it's a three-volume work, um, you know, he's only a man. Um, his Dogmatics is very poor in dealing with opposing views of theology. If you look at Karl Barth's work um, and his dogmatics, you'll find uh, that he speaks in fourth tongue. He, he, he talks double Dutch. You uh, often say one thing and then deny it in the next chapter. So you'll talk about the elect, that there is the elect of God. But then he'll say everybody's elect. So there's a contradiction there. Either there is the elect or there isn't the elect. But he'll talk about the elect of God. And then he'll say everybody's going to be elected. In other words, there's no difference between the church and the world. So you've got to be careful with these neo-Orthodox theologians. And be aware that theologians today, they can use Christian language, seem nearly Orthodox, but actually be a million miles away from what Christianity actually is. And that's what you get with the Neo-Orthodox. So we've looked at the Enlightenment, we've looked at liberal theo theological development, we've looked at the historical, we, we've looked at the history of religion school in Trollich, We've looked at the historical Jesus studies, and we've looked at dialect, dialectical theology. Now, all these influences went into Rudolf Bultmann. Rudolf Bultmann would have eat, breed this intellectual atmosphere as he goes on to do his theology. So now we'll just look at one or two things that he says there. Brief Eric Fuster in Brand Jasper Rudolf Bultmann's work Wekong, nineteen eighty four, page seventy three, seventy four. Translation is my own, says uh, David Ferguson. In a in a letter.
I must frankly confess to you that the war was not shattering experience for me. Of course, there were endless issues, but not the war as such. It is clear to me, as I have maintained in numerous conversations, that what happens in a war is not different from peacetime, a shipwreck, an act of meanness as they occur daily. Present to us exactly the same question as the mass of events in the war. I do not believe, therefore, that the war influenced my theology. On the question of the origin of our theology, I am of the opinion that the internal debate with the theology of our teachers plays an incomparably greater role than the experience of the war or the reading of Dostoevsky. So I'll read that again. I must frankly confess to you that the war was not a shattering experience for me. Of course, there were endless issues, but not the war as such. It is clear to me, as I have maintained in numerous conversations, that what happens in war is not different from peacetime, a shipwreck and act of meanness, as they occur daily, present to us exactly the same question as the mass events in the war. I do not believe, therefore, that the war influenced my theology. On the question of the origin of our theology, I am of the opinion that the internal debate with, it, with theology of our teachers plays an incomparably greater role than the experience of the war or the reading of Dostoevsky. So what Bultmann is saying there is in the context of the First World War, liberalism died a death, basically. Liberal theology had the idea that man would get better, that we would just do social action and social projects, and the world would get better. But when the First World War came, the liberal theology just was destroyed, just decimated. Bultmann says, I must frankly confess to you that the war was not a shattering experience for me. So for Bultmann, the First World War was not, did not destroy his liberal ideas, liberal in theology. And then he goes on to say that on this question of the origin of our theology, I am of the opinion that the internal debate with the theology of our teachers plays an incomparably greater role than the experience of the war. So what he's saying there is tradition, the liberal tradition, the Schleiermacher, the Hermann, the Rachel and all the rest of it, that liberal tradition is central. That is what he's concentrating on. That is what he's reflecting on. That is, he's continuing the legacy of the liberal tradition in theology. So now, um, I want to bring your attention to the Miracle of Faith chapter. Excuse me. Bullman believed that God was not knowable as in a mathematical formula. I think God is known in the act. There is no objective truth as in a world view. Um, we read in uh, David Ferguson's book, the results of object to objectify a tale setting out a thesis which can be discussed and acknowledged in detachment from the reality in question. The results of objectification are the fruits of human labor. But when objectifying patterns of thought intrude into the theology of faith is distorted. So he's saying there that there is no access to objectivity in the knowledge of God. And if we try to do that, that will spoil our understanding of God. I completely disagree with that. I completely disagree. I believe there is objectivity. You can look at the life and death of Jesus and that can lead you to an objective knowledge of God. I believe there is experience that comes into it, subjective experience, and I would grant Boltman that. But it's more than just 
personal experience is based on objective truth. So basically what we get then in Bultman is he uses Christian language of faith and the teaching of the Bible's understanding of faith but he uses it as a cloak for his existential philosophy. So we read, faith is never self-evident, natural, it is always miraculous. So hearing that, you would think he believes in miracles. He doesn't believe in miracles. The belief that God is the Father and man is the child of God is not an insight we can be gained directly. It is an insight at all. It is not an insight at all. On the contrary, it must be believed even and again as the miraculous act of God. So again, knowledge, a knowledge of God and knowledge of religion is an act of faith, a crisis of faith in terms of the moment you exercise faith then you are resolving the crisis. But that, that's not Christianity. Christianity teaches you have faith in Christ objectively speaking and then you'll get saved. So Boltman uses the words like justification um, and all the rest of it and it almost sounds like evangelical theology but it's not, it, it's again this existential philosophy. He writes, we know about revelation because it belongs to our life. You cannot communicate a concept of revelation to someone in the way in which you can communicate to him that there are species of fish that bear with you young alive or that there are carnivorous plants. There is no revelation in this sense. Rather, if you speak to someone of revelation, you speak to him about his authentic life and the conviction that revelation belongs to his life, just as do light and darkness and love and friendship. So again, it's about experience. It's about lived experience in the now. That is what truth is. That is what knowledge of God is. It's lived experience in now. Well, Christianity is more than just a lived experience. Christianity is a knowledge of the objective living God through Jesus Christ, who is objectively real. It's not just an experience. It's an experience of objective truth. So we could go uh, into more extensive thinking about Boltman's teaching on uh, on faith, but I think basically to sum it up, faith is basically an action, a moment by moment action in every new situation is a new chance to act in faith and that is truth and that is knowledge of God again I would disagree I would say that faith is in an object it is faith is in the objective truth of Jesus Christ um, and that is our faith and we have a moment by moment trust in such a person who is truly alive and real so basically what we've done in this video is looked at the intellectual roots of liberalism and Rudolf Bultmann 
and it, it's very very key if you want to understand theology if you want to really master theology then having a good understanding of how the 19th century theology played out it is a good place to stand and that's what we've done in this video we've really just looked a little bit about the life of Bultmann and then really just unpacked uh, the intellectual foundation of Western theology in the 19th century uh, starting from a later date than the uh, Enlightenment <coughs> and then I've gone over the ground and just picked apart a little bit these various theological movements to show you how easily it can be done but at the time these movements were massive and everybody followed them or seemed to think that they were important so that's where we're finished now we'll pick up tomorrow hopefully on um, we'll talk a little bit more about Boltman's idea of faith and then we'll move on to his ideas of hermeneutics and we'll move on uh, to his idea of the theology of the New Testament and his demythologizing program and then look at uh, post Boltman uh, scholarship um, so that's where we're going I uh, hope you've been blessed by this video and uh, so I'll see you tomorrow night here you want to come back for part two on Rudolf Bultmann so take care and God bless you I'm going to close in prayer Lord I thank you for this day and I thank you for your love and your grace I give you the prayers of the glory and the honor and father I just pray that you bless this video uh, to your people may they become wiser and stronger in faith in your name and for your glory amen amen God bless you and see you tomorrow or in the next day or two take care